Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the cheap underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now here's your host, David Hinojosa. Welcome to another edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host this week, David Hinojosa, and today I'll be talking with Sean Askinosi on his new book, Meaningful Work, A Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling, and Feed Your Soul. Sean Askinosi is the founder of Askinosi Chocolate, a company that practices direct trade and profit shares with farmers in Tanzania, Ecuador, and the Philippines. Askinosi Chocolate also partners with schools in their origin communities to provide lunch to 2,600 children every day with no outside donations. Their business model has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and on Bloomberg, and numerous other media outlets. Sean was named by O, the Oprah Magazine, as one of 15 guys who are saving the world. He's a family brother at Assumption Abbey, a Trappist monastery near Ava, Missouri. Sean, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed reading your book. I found many of the lessons, the experiences, and the exercises you actually include in your book very insightful. I'd like to start... I'd like to start this interview with a little bit on your background. You're a lawyer that specializes in criminal defense, right? That's right. As okay. uh, a matter of fact, I started my law, I started my law practice in Texas. Um, oh, really? Okay. And, uh, my wife, yeah, my, my wife is from Texas, and so I've got a lot of family there. And after law school, she said, guess what? We're moving to Texas. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. So I started there, but most of it has been in southwest Missouri for 20 years. It was uh, trial uh, criminal trial law. Yeah. I see. Now, you mentioned in your book that uh, there was a case in particular that made you begin to think about a change in your vocation or finding your vocation. Could you tell us a little bit about that case, please? Yes. Um, this is a case where a woman believed that her daughter was being sexually abused mm-hmm. by her ex-husband with a uh, good good reason to believe that. And so she thought that it would be better for them both to die uh, Mm -hmm. than for her to give her daughter back to her ex-husband. And so anyway, she went into the garage and turned the car on after giving her daughter a sleeping pill. And her um, seven-year-old daughter did die. And the mother almost died. Mm -hmm. And she went into a coma and they woke her up and charged her with first-degree murder. And I defended her. And uh, it was a very, very high-profile, very challenging case. And at the conclusion of the case, uh, the trial, the jury was sequestered. So this long, the judge called us into chambers. I'd been fighting with the judge the whole throughout the whole trial. He threatened to hold me in contempt. It was very contentious. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said at the at the right before closing arguments, he said, "Okay, here's what we're going to do, uh, Sean. I'm going to put your client on probation, Mr. Prosecutor. You're going to reduce the charge to second degree murder, so I can do that." and go tell your client. Uh, well, I mean, we still have the option to not do that deal. So I went into the little outer room uh, outside the courtroom and spoke with my client, <clears throat> mm-hmm. told her what was going on. And I said, we can keep going. We can keep fighting. And at that moment, mm-hmm. um, she said, no, Sean, you've, you've, you've done your job, and this is good. And at that moment, um, I was, I just kind of, I mean, it was a very emotional moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of uh, broke down, so to speak. I mean, not like on the floor, but, and she held me. So the, the person that I was protecting was, Mm -hmm. had sort of turned around and was now protecting me. Uh, Well, we went on into the courtroom and she accepted that. Of course, it was, I mean, a win because she was able to get on probation and Mm -hmm. it was a terrible case. I mean, she would have rather... She would have rather died. And anyway, so it was after that case, at that moment, and after that case, that I began to realize I couldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. Not because I didn't believe in it, because I loved it. And I've worked for many, many clients, and I'll always remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was called to that work. But, um, you know, I, if you're an airline pilot and, you're, and you are called to uh, be an airline pilot, and you decide one day that that's no longer your calling and that you don't think you should do it, you probably need to not be an airline pilot. Absolutely. And, and, I'm not, and, and so the same, I think, is true in criminal law when you have people's lives in your hands and their future freedom and, or lack thereof. And so I, I, needed, to, I needed to quit. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you, you started 
searching for this vocation and how long did it take you to to come to a realization okay this is what I'm going to do it took me five years mm-hmm. and um, I think it took me longer than it might others mm-hmm. because I searched so hard <laughs> so in this sort of weird way, the harder I looked, the more intense the search became, the, the more out of reach it was. And maybe your listeners could relate to that, I don't know, but um, that's the way it was for me, so it took five years and involved a great deal of prayer, mm-hmm. um, really really a very simple prayer, which was, dear God, please give me something else to do, mm-hmm. and uh, I said that many times, uh, and many times a day sometimes. And um, and so yeah, that that was a it was a long process. And I had no idea it would take that long. And I looked at all sorts of businesses, looked at, and nothing was really. I, 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 how do I say it? Well, I could not, I couldn't find an inspiration. Mm-hmm. And I needed I needed that. I needed to feel a sense of just you know purpose um, mm-hmm. of like this is what I should do. And that was the struggle for me. Okay. Would you consider that as the biggest challenge, uh, not quite finding something, or were there other something else that was more challenging in, in this process? I would say it 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 was the most challenging part of the process, mm-hmm. um, and I and I find that to be true in other people that I speak with who they know they want to do something else. Mm-hmm. They just don't know what. And you might say, well, how could that be? We're in an, the age of information. I mean, we're, information surrounds us. I mean, it's exponentially available. Yeah. Well, that makes it harder. Yeah, there's an mm-hmm. overload of information, right? Yes, exactly. And the overload, you know, makes us, uh, well, the overload prevents us from just kind of unplugging and reflecting and thinking and meditating and Mm -hmm. just having a moment of solitude where we can think, you know, Mm -hmm. because there's just so much coming at us. Yeah. Now, uh, you talk about confronting and embracing your sorrow as part of the search of finding your vocation. How important is this? I believe that confronting our sorrow and our broken hearts Mm -hmm. is paramount. I think, um, I'm not saying it's the only way. I'm not saying that this book or even that chapter, those two chapters, Mm -hmm. are the prescription. What I'm saying is is that it's one way, and I think it's an important way, and I think that if people go to the next thing without doing some kind of work like this that I described, Mm-hmm. then they'll find themselves right back where they were. And so um, I think that this work of of unmasking our sorrows, mm-hmm. as I talk about in the book, as, as, as paraphrased by Khalil Gibran, then we're, we won't find the place of joy. And I think that joy is a place for us to, us, we, we, we aspire to joy mm-hmm. in our work day. We we want some of that, yeah. and and I think it's important then to 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 confront and befriend and embrace and have a conversation with our sorrow. I see. Now, uh, one of the uh, other things that you mentioned in your book is uh, while finding or searching your vocation, one needs to ask. Uh, you need to ask yourself this one question: What does the world need? Could you tell us a little bit about this? Yes, I can. Um, One of the things that I encourage people to do is look at the intersection Mm -hmm. of what are you good at, Mm -hmm. or another way of saying what's your skill set, what are your talents, what is the intersection of what you're good at Mm -hmm. and what you're passionate about and what the world needs. So is is there an intersection point or points? Is there a you know, sort of circle that which you could draw around those intersection points of what the world needs, what you're good at, um, and what you're passionate about. Uh, you may be passionate about playing for the NBA, and maybe the world needs um, another great NBA player. But if you're not skilled at basketball, then maybe it might not be in that circle. 
Yeah. And so what, what? So I'm saying, yes, dream and mm-hmm. dream big, but it also needs to be achievable. And so when I say what the world needs, mm-hmm. what I mean is, well, does the world need another great interviewer and another radio show? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, the world does need, there, or does, does the world need another great surgeon? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. But, but what I'm saying there also is, how do we define world? Mm-hmm. Is the world my neighborhood where my chocolate factory is, where mm-hmm. there are poor people on the street and poor people in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah, that is, that is the world. Mm-hmm. Does the world need my factory to be at that address? Yes, I think it does. Mm-hmm. Does the world need, uh, well, well, we can also define world in the literal sense, but what about the cocoa farmers? Mm-hmm. You know, does the world need, does the world need people to engage directly with cocoa farmers to give their story life um, mm-hmm. to others so that they can see what it is they're buying? Yes, it does. It does. And so I also don't, I, I, I want to be careful to say to your listeners that this intersection of passion, mm-hmm. skill set, and what the world needs, it mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily have mm-hmm. to ostensibly or overtly appear to be a social good. Mm-hmm. By that I mean, well, what if I want to open um, a, a soup restaurant and all I make is soup? Yeah. Well, does the world need that? Mm-hmm. Well, you, the argument can be made, yes, it does. Yes, it does. I mean, because if I'm if I if I commit myself to the excellence of this soup, and it's the best soup in my town, and it serves people and it warms their hearts, and yeah, yes, yes, and I would argue, okay, well, maybe overtly it's not some social good, but I would say yes, it does. The world does need that, and so that's how I define it. I see. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that because you touched on other points that I'd like to talk about. Um, no. Yeah, and if I could, if I could, and I, and, I, and I don't mean to interrupt, but if, if I could also say too, David, yeah. let's also make sure that we go back to this uh, point of sorrow. And not to, I don't want to like overly emphasize it, but I do think there's some points to make there that I think your listeners would be interested in. Uh, I think so. Well, if we have time and just and you want to do that, then let's go back to that. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and and and, and do that. Um, I, I want to ask you about. You state that business businesses need a vocation for survival. Could you please elaborate a little bit more on this? There, the Gallup survey, most recent Gallup survey, says that one in three American workers is engaged in their work. Mm-hmm. And um, so this means that this is, this is the canary in the coal mine telling us American business people, both workers, leaders, entrepreneurs, owners, that, well, what does this mean? If the, the other, the, if only one in three is engaged, yeah. then that means that our products and services are at risk. And so the very survival of our companies really is, is at risk. The companies and the work that we do and the way we employ people is at risk. Because we know that ultimately, if people aren't engaged, it will affect the resulting product or service. Mm-hmm. I love the quote by Khalil Gibran. As he says, if you bake bread with indifference, you bake a bitter bread that feeds but half man's hunger. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? So if, 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 we, if we commit our daily work with indifference and we aren't engaged, then the end result is not good and it's not a good sign for our American companies. And so what do we do? Well, one of the things that we do is we need to find ways to create real meaning and purpose in the day. And apparently, it's not by putting a ping pong table uh, in the workplace or saying that people can take naps. It's deeper than that. People need to feel a sense of connection with each other and a sense of purpose that is bigger than themselves. That's it. People, people need to feel part of a bigger story. And if they do, then there's a greater likelihood that they will be engaged. And so, yes, we need it. We need it for our, we need it for our emotional and spiritual and physical well-being. Mm-hmm. Gosh, who wants to go to work all day and spend 80,000 hours in their lifetime and not be engaged in their work? So we need it for that. Mm-hmm. And we need it for our economy. Our economy will not survive if only one in three workers is engaged. 
Okay. And ultimately, I believe that the capitalism as we know it won't survive. Mm-hmm. It needs to evolve with these concepts at the forefront of meaningful work. So you think every every what you're saying is every business should, if they don't have that purpose or if they don't, they're not part of a larger thing, they should get involved in something like that. I think so. I mean, okay. I mean, there of course there are going to be outliers. I mean, if you own a pharmaceutical company that just had their drug approved by the FDA to cure cancer mm-hmm. and you you don't even all you care about is the money and you don't care about anything else and okay well maybe 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 you don't need a vocation and you're you're just fine but I'm but I'm saying for the for the majority of small businesses in America mm-hmm. that they need to have some coming together to create engagement in work or this whole system that we're in will ultimately collapse because the products won't be good and the service won't be good. Do you think, think about a hospital, yeah. a hospital whose leadership doesn't try to pull people together and engage them in their work. Ultimately the quality of service will be diminished. And we see it happening over and over in America today. Absolutely. And I completely agree with you. I think businesses should become, uh, should have more of a sense of purpose and for a bigger something bigger than them. So, absolutely. Well, in, in fact, and I agree with, I, and thank you for saying that, because here's the thing. Many business people believe, mistakenly, I think, mm-hmm. that if they do this, that it will be at the sacrifice of profit. And it's not true. Mm-hmm. And I'm a living example of it. Could I mean, I, so what we want to try to encourage businesses to think about, and even employees and leaders and businesses, is that this work, this meaningful work, having meaning in the workday, and even doing good and serving others in your neighborhood, does not need to come at the sacrifice of profit mm-hmm. at all. That is a that is a myth, mm-hmm. and we need to do what we can to dispel it, because um, it. I think if we can move away from this myth, we're going to be the better for it. Absolutely. I, again, I completely agree with you. Now, uh, you founded an award-winning chocolate factory. What attracted you about going into chocolate from the from the courtroom into uh, starting a chocolate company? I think one of the things that was attractive to me about chocolate is I knew that there was no end to the learning process. I love learning. I'm a curious person, um, and and so I think one of the cool things about chocolate is that if you think you've mastered it then just go to work tomorrow and there will be some challenge mm-hmm. uh, you know that may, like you know it's kind of in, in some sense like wine i suppose i mean i've never made wine but but the crops change every year you know our cocoa beans change because the crops change mm-hmm. and so we're we have to be ready to sort of embrace that and figure out how we can make the most of the flavor of those beans from crop to crop and year to year and that's one of the things i love about it the other thing is very technically challenging to make chocolate with just two ingredients, which is cocoa beans and sugar. Mm -hmm. We make our own cocoa butter. We're Mm -hmm. one of the few people in America to do that, and that's really challenging. So I guess the long answer or short answer is that I love the challenge of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's not easy. I know that may sound kind of strange. Well, don't you want something? But no, I really, I I want to be, I want to be challenged. And so there's really no bottom to the pool of what can be learned in chocolate, and I will always be learning more about it, and that's something I love about it. Well, let me let me segue into the next question, because, yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the challenges of op- uh, operating a chocolate factory, and uh, I read in your book, I found this very interesting. You mentioned that eight companies in the world control the world's cocoa bean supply, and six companies comprise 40% of the total market share. How difficult was it to get into this business when a lot of the share is, is taken? The, it, it, it wasn't hard to get into it at the level that we started, or even, frankly, at the level we are now, because we are so below the radar of those companies. Mm. We fly so low compared to where they fly mm-hmm. that I can say in 12 years, I've only been affected a handful of times directly by those companies when I say directly, I mean where they tried to, you know, stop us from buying beans or threatened us through local buyers or, 
uh, not 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 a direct threat, but I mean, you know, we're, so so because we buy so few beans compared to them, now we have an impact that has definitely threatened some of those larger companies because they don't want us paying more money to farmers for cocoa beans. But it, th- so from that standpoint, it wasn't really hard, and it still isn't. I mean, we we are. I don't know. We may be one of the only, maybe the only chocolate company in America that also is the importer of record of the cocoa beans. And so, um, and so that, that makes it on the one hand easier because I go see the beans. I go travel to these farms every year yeah. and have for almost 12 years. And that, so that, that part makes it easy because I see the beans there and then I see them at my factory. But um, those companies, those companies that control the cocoa market in the world mm-hmm. have essentially contributed to this. And here's what they've contributed to. In the last 30 years, when adjusted for inflation, the price of cocoa beans has remained unchanged. Yeah. That's, that is unbelievable. And so that's what's happened to farmers, mm-hmm. the cocoa bean farmers around the world, that they're essentially getting the same price that they did 30 years ago. And that's wrong. And, 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 and we, we lovers of chocolate, you know, we consumers of chocolate need to participate in something mm-hmm. that is other than that, you know, because we need to, we need to change that. And, uh, yes, yeah, hey, you know what, my chocolate bars, some of them are 10 bucks, 12 bucks for a chocolate bar. People say, well, why should I do that? Well, I can get a Snickers bar for $1.50 at the, you the know, 7-Eleven. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're at the grocery store because... The people who made that dollar fifty chocolate bar are are contributing to the extreme poverty of those farmers who grew those beans and toiled and suffered to harvest those cocoa beans. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and so I think we are incumbent. It's incumbent on us to learn about the plight of those farmers. And people say, "Well, oh man, can't you just let me enjoy the chocolate bar? I just want to. <laughs> I just want to eat my chocolate bar. Do I really need to think about this?" Well. They now, should, yes. as we were talking about earlier, they should because the information is available to us. I mean, the same thing, the same exact thing was said or could have been said when Cesar Chavez was trying desperately to help these migrant workers in California and, 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 and around the United States. And, and so and he was successful. He was successful. And so we need that same thing now. We need that same effort mm-hmm. to, to highlight the plight of these farmers and, 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 and I, you know, and I have a responsibility too, you know, just in my own small little way. I mean, I need to, I need to be part of this solution. And part of it is by explaining, you know, just how bad off the farmers have it. Absolutely. And it's it's yeah. not good. And, and I, I particularly found that very admirable from your company. I mean, you, you're involved in, in profit sharing. And, and I want to talk about the community programs that you have created. I mean, that you and your mm-hmm. company have created. Could you tell us a little bit about, about those, and not only in the States, but also abroad? Sure. Well, um, the first one is called Chocolate University. And um, we just have 17 people in our company, as I mentioned. It's a really small family company. But um, we created this the day one of the chocolate factory, Chocolate University, to engage the underprivileged kids in a homeless shelter uh, just across the block from our factory. At that time, there were 80 kids a night in that shelter. And I said, you know, let's find a way to engage them in the schools that they go to. So we started this Chocolate University in the elementary school, then the middle school, now we have a summer school, middle school program, mm-hmm. and, a, and we have a high school program. And the high school program is for local Southwest Missouri high school students to compete to be part of this program. We just selected our class for 2018 last week. And this is so cool. I mean, I'm, this, this program literally fills me up, and here's how it works. These kids apply. They, the, the, the ones who are selected, half of them are scholarship. You know, their parents are cardiologists or whatever. The other half... You know, we it's four thousand bucks a kid, and I raise the money for them from mm-hmm. donations. I can't afford to do that, and so, but mm-hmm. they're super awesome kids. You know, four point oh GPAs. They come and stay on a nearby uh, university campus for a week near the factory. They learn about our business. They learn about our our model. They learn about our financials. They learn how to make chocolate. They go home and pack for a day. I meet them at the airport, and we go to Tanzania. And um, this is a life-changing, and I don't, I use that term intentionally. It's a life-changing experience for these students, because when they meet the, mm-hmm. 
the farmers, I've worked with these farmers for long, that as soon as the students get there, they are embraced by these farmers as if they were members of the family. And so this is a very, very unique experience for these young people. And I, I mean, I still hear, I hear, I heard from a student last night. I mean, I hear from students from back from 2009. And um, it, it's just, uh, it's, it's hard to describe. We, we detail it a lot in the book. But it's one of the most fulfilling things for me to watch these students uh, have their hearts transformed by this experience. And so that's one. The other one is, the other big one that we have is a school lunch program in Tanzania and the Philippines. And uh, just in the spring, we passed our million meal mark, wow. where we've provided uh, sustainable school lunches for these schools with zero donations from anyone. Mm-hmm. It's all sustained by the yes, there are PTAs, these little jungle schools, that make a product. In Tanzania, they make rice. We sell it at our website. Um, askanosi.com, and if somebody buys a kilo of rice, it's beautiful, wonderful rice, then that feeds 220 kids in Tanzania. One kilo of rice, you buy, you pay me 1650 that goes back to the school, and that's 220 meals. So our little place then, now, we're gosh, we're almost, we're approaching 1.5 million meals, and it's sustainable in the sense that these schools know that eventually they'll be on their own, mm-hmm. and um, and some of them are on their own now. And, of course, we monitor the height, weight, and school attendance of these kids um, to make sure that we're, you know, making progress by feeding them. And um, so, yeah, that's two of the programs that we that are really, really important part of who we are. And, you know, one question comes up is, well, what does that does that have any impact on your chocolate? Yes, mm-hmm. it does. And the reason it does is because we believe that who we are as a company mm-hmm. is – so intertwined with our product, the resulting product, that they're inseparable. So you could take our recipe and our beans to somebody else, and they're not us, and it wouldn't be the same chocolate bar mm-hmm. because of who we are as a company. Not that that's some – I'm saying it, it's a truth. It's, it's a truth because we believe that, that just that our tasks at hand during the day mm-hmm. and then the things that we do impact the final product. Like you say in your book, it's not about the chocolate, it's about the chocolate. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, I said, I just said that to somebody yesterday. That's what, and people look at me like, what? what do you, but that's, yeah, yes, thank you. That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. And it could be the same thing for anybody else's business, you know? It's not about the transmissions we repair. It's about the transmissions we repair. You know, I mean, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, love, Absolutely. I appreciate that. I, I, again, I found your book uh, very insightful. We're running out of time. There's so many things I would have okay. liked to sure. uh, have asked you. Um, I, I wanted to get into the whole faith aspect of your business. And mm-hmm. um, uh, I guess at this point, is there anything you'd like to add? Or do you have any advice for people who want to make a mm-hmm. change yes. in their life and st- maybe start business or start something different. Uh, do you have any yeah. any of those? Yeah. Yes. This, the, the, this is. I'll keep this short. Uh-huh. Here's the advice. Two words. Don't wait. If you're a business and you say, I want to help my neighborhood, I want to help the community, I want to help people around the world, uh-huh. and but I don't have the money, I don't have the employees, I don't have the cash flow, I don't have the line of credit. My, I hear this every day. I'm, I want to look you in the eye. I wish you're a listener. I wish I could see your listeners, and I'm, I'm speaking to them right now, and I'm saying, don't wait. Mm-hmm. The universe will conspire to help you. I promise. Just take one step. Don't wait. That's my advice. Well, Sean, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today, and I congratulate you, and I wish you the best on your book. I think what you're doing is amazing. Your your chocolate company is is, is breaking the mold and how business is uh, conducted and and i just want to uh, congratulate you on that and and i think everyone who reads this book will be better for it and uh, because i found it very insightful and i think they will too thank you i, I love talking with you thank you and thank you likewise sean i've been talking with sean eskinosi on his new book meaningful work a quest to do great business find your calling and feed your soul a great read I want to remind our listeners that you can always listen to our program on our YouTube page, Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. This is your host, David Inojosa. Thank you for listening.